Hey, it's Mr. Bleeker here. Moving on to Phylum Annelida, the advanced worms. Now, technically, in your textbook, this is chapter 27, section 3. What's different about what we're going to study here, as opposed to our Phylum Platyhelminthes, which were our flatworms without an internal coelom, and 27.2, Phylum Nematoda, are parasitic worms that really kind of had an internal hollow body cavity, that coelom, but it, it was just sort of poorly formed. We're going to move into the annelids, phylum annelida, where they've got a very well-developed hollow internal body cavity that makes all sorts of space for internal organs. So let's get going. This is topic 10, and uh, away we go. Another edition of the old in-class show. So let me just turn on reflector they renamed it. it's called reflector now and we'll get going there is a huge amount of earthworm anatomy that we cover but the good news is a lot of these body systems start to become something that you've already seen um, looking at an earthworm just glancing at it now what I can tell you is that when you observe this little structure right here called its clotellum As soon as you see that, you know that you've hit about the top third of your earthworm. And it's this top third which includes a lot of the important structures that we'll study. The hearts, circulatory system, nervous system, um, we'll look at the excretory system, etc. It, from that point on, there is a lot to study. So let's get going on studying our earthworm because there's a fair amount here. So the term annelid literally means ringed. Kind of a Latin term which means ringed. And that makes a lot of sense if you look at an earthworm. You can see the... Let's hit done here. There we go. I'll just grab a red color. You could see the ringed segments in the earthworm. And this is something you didn't see in the primitive worms. Nematodes like um, Ascaris, you couldn't see that. Platyhelminthes, you didn't observe that. Now the closest thing to segmentation uh, observable in ourselves, if you look at our vertebral columns, you'll see that the cervical vertebra and if you go down towards your back your thoracic vertebra and then down towards the base of the spine uh, if you get down to the lumbar vertebra you definitely see that our vertebrae are segmented so it's not a surprise that some of our more distant relatives would have developed that first so the big ticket items on our friend the earthworm is that they have a true coelom okay and that they are segmented as all get out. A true coelom, just so we're being clear here, a true coelom has to develop in the mesodermal tissue. As we move on to the next slide you'll see that it can't develop from the endoderm because the endoderm is primarily your digestive tract passing through your body and your ectoderm is your sort of your outer layer. So the mesoderm had to be where the hollow fluid filled area had to develop. And here we go. Three germ layers. We remember that we had the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And that's kind of old hat by this point. Let's choose a nice black color. This region in here that I'm coloring in sort of in this dark sort of zigzag pattern is the coelom. Now it's hollow but it's also fluid filled. There we go. And it's in this space that you get a really well developed area to put body systems so it becomes a very evolutionary significant space. As I said before, the annelid body is developed into segments. 
Now those segments are, it's kind of interesting. You have to do the earthworm dissection to actually see what we call the individual septa or one by one. We say that each one is a septum. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in here. When you zoom in on the earthworm and when we cut it open, you will see these little folds on the inside. And I'll just draw a few in. And those separate each region of the earthworm. Um, basically think of it's the internal folds of each ring. So if these are our rings here, you'll find folds on the inside that continue to separate each space. So those are called septa. Now there's a lot to these diagrams and we'll be getting to each element of this. You can get overwhelmed with the anatomy. But what I really want you to know is that the earthworm is divided into regions and it's if you think about it that's not really a, a bad idea humans have a cephal region or a cephal region your head region we have a thoracic region where you would find the the heart and the lungs abdominal region where you would find our intestinal sort of tract and area and uh, bowels etc leading out sort of to our um, release of waste products this isn't an uncommon idea so we'll go through the, the body systems, but each segment is walled right off. So it's important to know these internal walls. And it's important to know that they're called septa. Okay. Earthworms travel underground, so they don't have a lot of use for things like eyes, etc. They're not all of the annelids are earthworms. In fact, we'll study, um, we'll be talking about the various classes of phylum annelida. But it's interesting to understand that as we look at more kind of advanced worms, some of their segments could contain eyes. Now that, that's not with your garden variety earthworm that plows underground. It doesn't really need them. But as we look at some of the earthworms that swim around in the water, well, I shouldn't say earthworms, annelids, you'll see that they can have antenna and some advanced kind of sense organs. And we might even see, well, I'm giving it away, I guess. We might even see some organs pop up for respiration, such as gills. Now, the body segments are specialized, but you have to ask yourself a question. How do these worms move around like what's their locomotion if you've ever held an earthworm and you felt the sides you feel these little bristles so i want to denote that right now little bristles called setae and there's a few of them few sets going off each segment um, and what they do is they're like little anchors in the soil so when an earthworm wants to move and i keep coming back to an earthworm each time they act as anchors and the earthworm can move itself through the ground it doesn't have limbs so the closest thing that it actually has are these little bristles to apply itself to the soil and then sort of squiggle forth and and move on so kind of interesting if you ever wonder about a lot of things a lot of annelids it's like well what are they and it's kind of a tube within a tube sort of design which is what they're talking about here the worm itself is a tube and what they're referring to is an earthworm uh, plows through the soil opens up its mouth at the appropriate time and ingests nutrients that it's like one long intestine as it plows through so its whole game plan of your garden variety earthworm is to plow through organic material swallow it and just pass it through its digestive tract and pick up uh, nutrition. So when they talk about a tube within a tube, they mean the digestive tract and the earthworm itself, if you sort of think about this, the earthworm itself, we're kind of talking about a tube, right? So I'll just do some squiggles here. And then we just have a digestive tract that we're plowing through the soil. So that's the idea of a tube within a tube. So here's where we get into the organ systems. Whenever you see them say form and function, that's kind of a heads up to say, all right, we're going to get into the body systems. 
annelids, phylum annelida, of which the earthworms are one, uh, the leeches are another, and what we call the bristle worms are a third major class. We'll talk about each variety, each major class as we get going here. But one important thing to note is that they've got very complex organ systems. Now we actually see the earthworm having to put some pretty specialized tissues together and come up with the organ systems. Our friend Lumbricus here is the one that we study in the lab, the one that we, we tend to uh, eviscerate and take apart. And you've got a you've got quite a, a diagram here. Um, I provide several. This is just one. Uh, one of the best things in the lab to get you to do is to draw the external parts and then once we open it up, label the internal parts. Don't worry, it's all coming up. So feeding and digestion. Well, before I get going, I really do want to talk about what the th what the major classes of phylum Annelida are before we sort of lose our heads and run into the body systems. And I, I think you should always do it this way. So phylum Annelida, I'll just make a little side note here, and I, you should do the same. Our little ringed like organisms is comprised of three major classes. The first class is our friend the earthworms and they fall into the oligochaeta group. So let's say that that's, oh, we'll leave a little space here. We'll run that in a second here. Our leeches named after uh, the component in their spit that continues to make you bleed even after they even after they let go of you um, class hyrudinia and the marine worms which i think don't get enough uh, exposure really um, class polychaeta there we go now we'll switch up colors and i like to put down a, a common example for each so this is our earthworm our leeches if you ever watched an episode of fear factor i don't think you could ever forget them and our bristle worms good so what we have now, let's switch up to a nice purple color, is the major classification scheme for all of the annelids that you're expecting to know, all of our little ringed friends. And if you've, you probably haven't looked at a leech up close, but it definitely does have segments. It's definitely got the little rings. So, let's see here. There we go. So the carnivorous species, um, the ones that tend to sort of attack you and they're, the, when I think of these, I think of the leeches and I think of the bristle worms. Uh, these little guys tend to attack and latch on. Leeches are just parasites, external parasites. Sharp jaws, you get the idea. Now, the gentle ones, the ones that we would all know and love, are sort of detrivores. They feed on decaying vegetation, would be our uh, class Oligochaeta. And our earthworms are the Oligochaetes that fall into that category. That's our little friend down here. Pretty gentle, nothing to worry about here. Now that he's hot pink. As opposed to our leech friend over here, who, interestingly enough, is sticking out uh, the sucker off the end right there. So you get a quick idea of the cephalization. And you can see the rings, but I'll just sort of draw these little markings so you get the idea. Now, if you've ever heard the term uh, from a Shakespearean play, fetch me a leech, they talk about fetching 
a leech, but what they're talking about is a doctor. Leeches, fascinatingly enough, have been a part of medicine for a very long time. There was a, a school of thought that they would remove the bad blood. More about that in a minute. So form and function in annelids. So where are we? We are at the digestive system. So let's call it because that's exactly what this is. Okay, so the pharynx that they're talking about here, if you've ever sucked a really thick milkshake and you've been pulling away at the straw, you've sort of felt the pain in the back of your throat. Well, that's your pharynx, the muscles that suck things in. And your pharynx pumps food and soil into the esophagus if you're an earthworm. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the earthworm has to suck the soil around it to swallow it and bring it into itself. So your pharynx, let's zoom in here, your pharyngeal region on an earthworm is right around here. It's very muscular, so I'll just kind of draw these muscles in here. And what they do is they, they pull the food in through the mouth, and they get it going through this uh, sort of pink structure, which is the esophagus. And that esophagus leads down to this point right here, right there which is the crop and we're sort of I guess as as humans not as aware of the anatomy of other animals as we should be the crop just switch this here there we go the crop is one oh, here we go is the first part of their stomach so you've got the crop and then the second half of the stomach is the gizzard. So I'll just draw it like this. So there's your crop and uh, we've got a little highlighter here so there's your crop first part and the gizzard is the second part after your esophagus which is this big long tube which leads down. If muscles of the pharynx, the sucking region obviously come in through the mouth so that labels it pretty well. The crop is all about storage. I'll switch colors here. There we go. The crop, interestingly enough, in us is like the top part of your stomach, which doesn't really do the mechanical digestion or the grinding. And if you think about this, whenever you've had stomach pains, it's the bottom of your stomach deep down where you felt that sort of grinding sensation where the hunger pangs come from. It's the gizzard which really in us is the bottom part of our stomach. In, in human beings the crop and the gizzard have come together but the gizzard is where mechanical digestion happens and things get ground into pieces. So the earthworm does a good job with its pharynx of pulling in passes it down the esophagus, fills up the crop, and when you do the dissection you'll feel that's quite a soft sort of little structure, but it's the gizzard where you can feel all the muscle. And then from that point on, it's passing the nutrients down through the intestine to just absorb into the bloodstream to obtain whatever is there. But since an earthworm is, is uh, a class of ligachete, is pulling in mostly sort of decaying vegetable matter, it really has to grind the daylights out of it to hope it to have a, a chance of pulling any form of nutrition out. Okay, here's the circulatory system. At this point, you get a fascinating, fascinating rather, sorry, circulatory system, and we say it's closed. And what we mean by that is that the circulatory system is we're always talking about blood flowing through a pipe. Now, believe it or not, there are things where the blood doesn't flow through a pipe. When we look at the clams, for example, there's times when their blood is actually splashing over the organs and it isn't inside of a tube. But since the blood is enclosed in a tube, we say that it's a closed circulatory system and that there's blood vessels. So we'll zoom in here. There we go. And just like human beings, 
we see blood vessels right here. Give me the tool there. Blood vessels here, 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 and here. And these blood vessels, what they're doing is they are picking up nutrition. Now those nutrients are being offered up by the digestive system. And when you come see me in Biology 12, we'll talk about this a little bit more. That's exactly the name of the game. That's, that's why it's set up this way. Send some capillaries, some blood vessels, over top of the digestive system and diffuse nutrients in from a high concentration in the gut lining into the bloodstream. And then the bloodstream is a super highway to send all the nutritive goodness to all the cells of our little friend, the earthworm. Now, the, the earthworm, I can't move on without showing you this, so I have to go to black. You can see that it has a dorsal blood vessel here. So we'll say, just do a quick label here, dorsal blood vessel. And by blood vessel, I'll just say BV. And below it has the opposite of dorsal, along its tummy, I guess, is its ventral blood vessel. Now the blood is taking a loop or sort of around the body. Now how does it get pumped? Well, these little structures right here, one, two, three, four, five, are essentially the hearts. You can think of them as uh, thick blood vessel tissue, but they're squeezing really hard. So they're acting like more or less like a heart would to send the blood circulating from the dorsal side to the ventral side and to pick up oxygen. Remember that earthworms breathe through their skin and to distribute nutrients throughout the body. There we go. Now in respiration, when you look at your oligochetes, they can breathe through their skin. And the reason they can breathe through their skin, and it warrants a, a diagram, is that they aren't, well, they're not really all that big. They're quite thin, so their surface area is really, really big. Think of it this way, lots of surface area. So they have a very high surface area. So that's, that is exposed to the air. But their internal volume, this region inside, isn't as big. So we'll call that the volume. If you have a really high surface area when compared to or divided by your volume, then it's likely that you can breathe through your skin. Now this isn't the same for us. And I remember my one of my old biology professors saying this. You know, we're, we've got more guts than we've got skin. And there's just too much going on inside our bodies. Too many cells and, and too many organs need oxygen. And too many cells and too many organs need nutrients. And they have to get rid of their carbon dioxide waste and the urea waste, etc. There's no way that we could just rely on the opportunity for waste products to just pass out, nutrients to just pass in. There has to, we have to rely on pump systems. We're, we're just too complicated. We're too big. What he meant was that we have too high of a, uh, we have too low, rather, of a surface area to volume ratio. We don't have enough skin for all of this internal volume that we have. So once organisms start to become more complex and their cells are screaming for nutrition and oxygen and to get rid of their waste, then there has to be a way, now, we'll talk about respiration here, to increase the surface area, to let those things pass out. That's what happens with our lungs with, uh, in, in humans, for example. Fish and some of the primitive worms, well, I shouldn't say primitive worms, but we'll talk about our annelid worms, will actually use gills. So our aquatic annelids. You're not going to see a set of gills on class oligochaeta. 
most of the Ligachetes are just the earthworms that you see plowing through the ground. So they're breathing through their skin. But once you get in the water, one thing you got to realize about the water is it's even more challenging. It's why gills uh, had to develop. Water has lower O2 than air does. So in order to survive, our friends here, these little worms, had to develop some kind of structure to give them an advantage. They couldn't just rely on diffusion. Let's come up with a new color. I think brown will work. So they had to come up, oop, undo. They had to come up with some gills in the head region. I had a nice brown color. Where'd it go? I don't know where it went. Let's call up orange. They had to call up some gills in the head region to give them a little bit more of an advantage to take in the oxygen and to release their waste product, which was CO2. Diffusion just wouldn't get the job done. So there's other waste products you need to get rid of. And you're about to see the origins, more or less, of uh, kidney tissue. So let's call this for what it is. Let's look at a different system instead of the respiratory system where we're talking about carbon dioxide and oxygen being exchanged, we'll look at the excretory system. Okay, as soon as you say the excretory system, things we excrete, of course you could talk about carbon dioxide. That's something that's excreted from our lungs. But when you think about the excretory system, other things come to mind. You have to get rid of ammonia waste. which is a byproduct of consuming uh, protein. That's a huge one, because if you think about ammonia, it's a, it's a very strong base in chemistry. And unless you really want your blood chemistry to change, you need to eliminate that. So, earthworms came up with some of the first sort of organs to filter out and get rid of this stuff. Zoom in on it now. The same relative tissue is found in humans and it's called nephridia. It's these interesting sort of purple little structures down here and it's a little loop system. Now I'm not doing it justice but I'll give you the, the rough idea and this loop system sends out the waste products. Now they're excreting urea which is a form of ammonia waste out through their skin. Now, interestingly enough, uh, human beings, we do this too. If you've ever uh, worked out for a long period of time and worn a white shirt, and if you didn't clean it, you'll notice, oh boy, the sweat stains are an interestingly sort of uh, saffron yellow color. And it can get really quite stinky, to say the least. And that's because this waste product is being produced uh, and released from our skin. Well, if you think about it, earthworms have been doing that for a very long time, producing this sort of urea-like waste product. As we move forward in evolution, these structures here, called nephridia, these little loop systems, and yes, you have to know that word, in biology, as soon as you see the name for it, you're on the hook for it. So these nephridia, when they're gathered up later on in evolution, start to form the primitive kidney. Remember, when you go to form organ systems, organs are formed from an amalgamation of tissue. So what is the tissue in this case? Well, the origin of the kidney is the nephridial tissue. So get to know this term. In grade 12, you're going to have to know exactly how this tissue works. But in grade 11, we just say, hey, this is a great tissue for cleansing the blood of waste products, especially ammonia-like ones called urea. But there's salt and all sorts of other things that it, it helps to release. Okay, a response system. Again, call it for what it is. It is the nervous system. So I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to call it for what it is. Nervous system. First thing we have to say is 
okay so we've got something here then they keep focusing on in on class oligochaetic because this is an earthworm and they say does this thing have a brain yeah it does right down here the first brain tissue is just a collection of nerve cells that are coordinating their activity and acting as a brain so that's more or less what we here have here this brain is just a collection of ganglions nerve clusters okay and in class I showed you an interesting ganglion that you can find in your wrist if you press hard enough on your hand but it's not as advanced obviously as the lobes of brain of a uh, cat a dog ourselves chimpanzee but this nervous tissue does follow this little sausage link sort of format here and it continues down and down and it continues all the way down the earthworm these in these little sausage clusters these little ganglia and that nervous tissue gives the earthworm the ability to control its um, muscular responses so whether it extends itself or contracts its muscles it has control over that so when we talked about cephalization you totally see it here because there is a brain in the anterior region of the earthworm and this is our anterior region here so cephalization is a pattern and it's a reality fact of life From this point on, you can see that, well, you know, the development of a nervous system is only going to get uh, more prolific. I tend to think of it as, I like to think of it almost as like the internet, where it started in sort of small regions and just radiated out, and you got more and more networks and more and more clusters. Uh, the nervous system was always going to expand. And if you look at the human body, our nervous system is incredibly complex. But even as we move forward to study the mollusks which is our next major phylum you're going to see that their nervous systems are amazingly complex and they're immediate relatives of these little worm-like critters so nature got going on the nervous system let me tell you that movement okay or locomotory system There we go. Earthworms have a coelom inside of themselves. That hollow, fluid-filled space. And the muscles can attach. If you think of the coelom like this, um, this isn't quite exactly how I'd normally show it, but if this was a fluid-filled space and it was like a water balloon, like a hard sack full of water, the muscles themselves could attach to it from other organs and they could they could use that as an anchor so that they could shorten because that's what muscles do so that'd be something for them to anchor onto and, and pull because that's all muscles really do is they they shorten and contract and they muscles only really either pull and the only reason they lengthen is when they relax so there's two types of muscles in an earthworm there's muscles that run lengthwise down the worm you kind of get the idea of the with the line I'm drawing and I'll just hit undo and then there's muscles which are circular like this and they can contract um, in this direction so you've got really got circular muscles and that you've got long or longitudinal muscles to enable an earthworm to move okay so I've got an animation for you here because I want to show you how this works um, interestingly enough the long muscles shorten the earthworm and the circular muscles lengthen the earthworm so I have to pop out and uh, turn off mirroring to show it to you okay let's put the iPad down and take a peek here all right and it's this one right here. All 
right, start the animation now. Let's pull this on over. Okay, so this is sort of the the motion of an earthworm. And what you can see is the little CT there hanging on. There we go. So the circular muscles, when they contract, you can see that they make each section longer. So when the circular muscles contract, that lengthens the earthworm and it stretches out and it reaches out kind of like a cat and it holds on to the soil. And as soon as it lengthens its body, it contracts its long muscles. So we'll just go back one here. Oop, lost it. It contracts its long muscles. Let's just put this down here. I think this is grinding on my earpiece. There we go. Uh, let's see here. Turn the labels off. Whole worm. There we go. Yeah, there we go. I like this. And as the earthworm contracts its circular muscles, it makes itself longer, and then it contracts its long muscles to make itself shorter. And you get this sort of interesting sort of wave-like pattern. Muscular waves. And those wave-like patterns pass down the earthworm. It's very neat when you watch an earthworm move. So again, remember, circular muscles, they squeeze the earthworm and they make it really, really, really long. And then the long muscles contract and they make it shorter. And it's waves of this which moves an earthworm through the soil. The um, setae, the little bristles, allow it to anchor itself in the soil. So this thing is plowing through the soil, aerating your soil, consuming organic matter when it chooses to and pooping out the other end so <coughs> the earthworm is an aerator and a fertilizer which is why we're always happy to have earthworms in our soil so pretty cool stuff uh, just make sure I don't have another animation for you here while I'm here um, neat little earthworm dissection you should take a boo at this before you come into the lab and, and chop into the earthworm And I did want to show you, uh, I got one more waiting here. When we're done with class Oligochaeta, we'll come back and we'll look at class Polychaeta, which is our marine variety worm. And don't worry, we'll get to leeches. I can't leave them out because they're so gooey and gross. Okay, so we have to go back and turn mirroring back on. Okay. And we're back. So the long muscles make it short and the circular muscles extend the worm. And it uses waves to make things happen. That is pretty cool. Reproduction. Well, here's one thing. Um, earthworms, if they find other earthworms, aren't necessarily going to be all that lonely. They have an advantage that they pretty well can reproduce with any earthworm they encounter. The oligochaetes are hermaphrodites. So we've got to zoom in on this. Some earthworm sex. And when we zoom in, what becomes readily apparent is that there's an exchange going on right about here. And there's an exchange going on around the clitellum region here. So zooming out. So what's happening? Well, since the earthworm have both male and female parts, they can exchange uh, sex cells with their partners. So inseminating um, your fellow earthworm is just as easy as just meeting one. And that's what's going on uh, in those two regions that we see here. There we go. They refer to this little band. This is an interesting region. Uh, when I pick up an earthworm, the first part of the earthworm that I pick up is right there. It's, a, it's called the clitellum. It's sort of in the first third of the earthworm. And that lets you know that you've sort of picked up the anterior region of the earthworm. The clitellum is, is a specialized set of segments. And what it does, um, the eggs get fertilized in this section and then 
basically what falls off are these little structures here after a while which are like little cocoons and that's clitellum's job is to sort of weave these little cocoons that you see here and here to contain the earthworm eggs so the earthworms are are generated from that so the clitellum is is not only sort of the region where fertilization happens but it's where these special little cocoons are woven so on most biology tests if you're ever asked what's the function or what does the clitellum do you say it helps to weave the cocoons that support the eggs and that's a pretty sort of stock answer so I'm kind of amazed that you get this far into a presentation and this is the first time that you hear about the major classes drives me insane and I've already gone over this but I'll hit it again you get class oligochaeta leeches it's not class leeches that's not correct they've given you the name the real name is hyrodinia which contain the leeches and class polychaeta which is your bristle worms So, got to make that distinction. Our ligachetes are just our little friendly little detrivores that are doing such a good job of plowing through the soil and fertilizing everything they come into contact with. So they're obviously extremely important to gardens and, and they keep the soil extremely well aerated, recycling material, so our class oligochaete, this is our little sort of veggie source, more or less. Now leeches are another line of the annelids, and they're external parasites, they're the blood suckers. And you've got a neat little analysis of them here. Uh, once they bite you, you will continue to bleed for quite a while, because they've got what a neat little sucker here. It's almost sort of three-toothed like this. And they just, they more or less, it's, it's sort of tough, uh, horny tissue. They can bite and they just gorge themselves on blood and fall off more or less when they're done. In grade 11 biology, we don't expect you to go to this level of knowledge, but <coughs> you could see that the earthworm or sorry rather the leech has an incredible concentration of salivary cells in the anterior region and this highly convoluted blood storage area where they can process their blood meal and simple intestines they don't really need all that much and sort of three lobed intestine here kind of get the idea and then they just pass their waste out through the anal region You see the jaws, you see the ridges of teeth, and lots and lots. It's always fascinating. Look at these salivary cells. Amazing. And they're producing that chemical called hyrudin. Which keeps us bleeding. It's a blood thinner of sorts. And it's why we name the class, class hyrudinia. We name them after that special material that they produce. Now there's a really neat um, there's a really neat uh, video that I want to show you, and it's going to be a little bit of a reproduction, but I'll I'll pop out for a sec. And if a limb is detached, like if you had your hand cut off, the problem with losing a limb or losing a finger, you think, well, let, I'll just put it back on. But blood tends to clot, and if the blood vessels, if the blood isn't flowing, then the tissue can't repair itself. See, we can heal as long as nutrients and blood and oxygen and carbon dioxide continue to flow. But not if the blood coagulates. Well, interestingly enough, I got a little video uh, from YouTube here that I'll show you. And what it's talking about is how um, leeches, because of the 
hyrudin chemical in their spit can keep the blood flowing in the case of even a severed hand and allow the hand to come back. You got to understand, this is there, there'd be a lot of tissue swelling involved here, and the doctor would have to say, "Well, I can reattach your hand, but there's no guarantee that the blood clots aren't going to cut off the flow of the of the uh, blood vessels." So I wanted to show you this. There we go. I won't let it run. Um, let's see here. Oh no, this isn't the one I wanted. Let's see here. Limb reattachment. Ah, that's the one I wanted right there. We'll go to full screen on this for a second. Just a little news report. So his, his uh, hand was cut off in an industrial accident. They reattached it, and they've attached leeches all over the hand so that the um, hyrudin would keep the blood flowing in the hand, and you get a picture of it there. It's fascinating. There we go. So we'll leave it at that. Just a quick little video there. So in the case of hand reattachment, uh, limb reattachment, anything where you need the patient to either drain or you need the blood vessels to keep um, more or less uh, keep flowing, um, class Hyrodinia, our friend the leeches, are a godsend. And leeches were used... Um, I've got another video on the course site you should check out there which talks about um, more or less sort of Roman medicine where the idea when you got sick you had bad blood in you so they would attach leeches to you and use more or less leech therapy to get the, the bad blood out of you. Um, because doctors did a lot of bloodletting at the time they referred to doctors as leeches and um, I referred to this earlier but the term fetch me a leech is synonymous with fetch me a doctor. True story. All right, so we've looked at class Oligochaeta, we've looked at class Hyrodinia, our friend the leeches, and um, I've had a lot of fun with those over the years. If you've ever gone swimming around the lakes, you might have gotten one on you. And then there's class Polychaeta. Now the Polychaetes, this literally means many bristles. So if you look at them, they've got lots of bristles all over the side, and they're very pronounced. But the difference is, and I always tell my students, the polychaetes are usually marine worms. Okay, so if an earthworm is in the water, how is it supposed to swim? You've got to zoom in on the setae, the little bristles, and say, look, I can't row through the water with a toothpick. This little toothpick off to the side isn't going to be of much use. So the polychaetes adapted a remarkable structure, which is just more or less sort of flesh around the, the setae, zoom in for a second here what they did with the little bristle which I've sort of drawn in black here is they let's choose an orange they developed a little bit of flesh around the outside like that now that flesh more or less made sort of an oar like structure so we say that what we got now isn't just cete but we say we've got these little feet that go all around the marine worm. So that's what this means. Little feet that go all around, parapodia. And you're seeing them. If I can get back to my color, there we go. You're seeing them here, and I'm drawing, you know, more or less to give you an idea. Here's all the parapodia that go around the marine worm so that it can swim through the water and sort of cruise around. And we're seeing 
a lot more of that over here. So pretty neat when you've got these new structures called parapodia because they're an improvement, necessary improvement in the water on setae. Setae would never have cut it. They're just bristles. You can't swim. Uh, you can't um, you can't swim with setae. That would be like rowing with a toothpick. You're not going to get anywhere. So setae need an improvement and we got parapodia as a result. Enough said. Oh, look at that. Takes us to the end of 27.3. Unbelievable. That goes pretty quick. So to review, you were introduced to three classes of, of annelid. You were looking at the bristle worms. You were looking at class Hyridinia, the leeches. Class Hyridinia, there we go. And you were looking at class Oligochaeta, which is, as I like to say, it's very cliched, your garden variety earthworm. So why are they important? Here's the huge reason why they're important because they have a true hollow internal body cavity and they have segmentation and they've their body systems are becoming very advanced region by region in the earthworm we're starting to see the development of body systems and this only cascades and carries on further okay so that's 27.3 our friends the annelids if you want to go online there's a great animation you can see how the um, the polychaete swims through the water so i should pop out and say you really need to need to go to the course site I show you as much as I can but I can't show you everything um, here we go let's see here there we go expand so you don't miss anything all right so we saw the medicinal leeches and limery attachment here there's a great little video called fetch me a leech which is the history of bloodletting and physicians if you want to watch someone get an, a leech attached to them that's what you want to watch um, there's our earthworm animation and down here a little bit lower class polychaeta the earthworm animation to see how they move you can click on this this is just a small version of it but this will take you to the full version of um, a polychaete swimming let's just go back one and um, you can get a great little sort of overview of that just by clicking on start the animation now and I'll just show you a little snapshot of it. it's pretty neat but you can attach the labels but you can see it still does the circular and the long muscle technique as it cruises through the water that's a very cool cool animation I'm very happy with that one all right zoom back down there we go remember to read over 19.3 it's not just good enough to listen to me you have work to do um, you've got your package and so much more okay ladies and gentlemen that's 27.3 and it's late so I'm going to bed night